to worship at Grace Lutheran Church on this, our fifth Wednesday in Lent. It's hard to believe in some ways that we're already this far into the Lenten season, and in other ways it feels like we've been in Lent forever. But regardless, uh, I'm thankful that the Lord has brought us together uh, in one means or another, or by one means or another, to uh, hear his word and let it bring peace and whisper peace into the, the chaos of our world and our lives right now. This evening's service takes a very deliberate turn. We're going to continue on our series of looking at some of the people from different countries that have a very profound impact on Jesus' ministry and in particular uh, in the passion narratives. But today we're going to really step into that, that Holy Week feeling as we look at Jesus just up until he is hung on the cross. And so the feeling gets a little bit more somber, but with that, the, the hope, the brightness of Easter is all the closer. And so that's the theme that we have before us this evening, and that's the theme that we have on our hearts and our minds as we begin worship together with our opening hymn.
day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. From the rising of the sun to its setting. In the name of the Lord is to be praised. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful. Slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and repentance of evil. Jesus said, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Christ was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. From the rising of the sun to its setting. The name of the Lord is to be praised. Glory, Glory be, be to, to the, the Father, and, and to the Son, and, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. A reading from Isaiah, the 42nd chapter. For a long time I have held my peace. I have kept still and restrained myself. Now I will cry out like a woman in labor. I will gasp and pant. I will lay waste to mountains and hills and dry up all their vegetation. I will turn the rivers into islands and dry up the pools. And I will lead the blind in a way that they do not know, in paths that they have not known. I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things I do, and I do not forsake them. They are turned back and utterly put to shame. Who trusts in carved idols? Who say the metal images, you are our gods? Hear, you deaf, you look, you blind, that you may see. Who is blind but my servant, or deaf as my messenger whom I send? Who is blind as my dedicated one, or blind as the servant of the Lord? He sees many things, but does not observe them. His ears are open, but he does not hear. The Lord was pleased, for his righteousness sake, to magnify his law and make it glorious. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Matthew chapter 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before them, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He was delivered up to death. He was delivered from the sins of the people. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. He was delivered up to death. He was delivered from the sins of the people. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He was delivered up to death. He was delivered from the sins of the people. Together we recall and recite the Ten Commandments. You shall, shall have, have no other, other gods. gods. You shall, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Together we recite our common Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe, I believe in God, the Father, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From whence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy 
Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Together we pray. Our Father, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of Jesus, amen. First, it was stay away from stadiums and big gatherings. Then, next that I can recall, it was don't be in a group bigger than 300. And then 250, and then I think 200, and then 100, and then 50, and then 10. And day by day, more states closed down to quarantine in place. It's interesting that the biggest fear and worry and complaint that I hear about people as we go through this health scare together is the one that I feel too, and that is the lack of social interaction, the lack of being around each other. We are afraid of being alone. And there's really good reasons for that, actually. If you ever read a study on loneliness, it can have horrible detrimental effects to our health, mental and physical. It can take years off of your life, the stress of it all. We want to be around one another. And there's good reason for that. God says it's not good for man to be alone. And so he knows that we would need assistance, we need support, we need encouragement, we need a shoulder to cry on, another person to laugh with. We need each other. And so I think it's no coincidence that as we look at all of the effects of sin in the world that Jesus came and Jesus died for, perhaps the worst is that it makes us alone. Sin is in every way a prideful statement of action on our part where we say, I know better than God what needs to be done here. And when we do that, we push God away. And when we think about all the ways in which our sinful actions affect one another, it's no surprise that sin pushes each other away too. And so, before too long, our sinful activity leaves us all alone. And so it's really no surprise that in a situation where our health could be at risk, instead what we're worried about is being alone. Because I think we're predisposed to run from punishment, run from danger, not want to think about anything like that. And so it's no surprise that if the consequence, the greatest collective consequence of our sinful action in this place that we call home is being alone, and the greatest eternal consequence of our sin is being away from God. That's where we pick up our text. Jesus is truly alone. Jesus has taken the sins of the whole world collectively throughout eternity upon himself. And right here when our text picks up, he has been turned over to the governor's guard, so now he's turned over to the Romans. Before he was with the temple guard, before he was largely with his own people, before even when he was in danger he had loved ones, disciples, at least in sight, now no more. Now he is absolutely alone. And if we think about the fact that he's been turned over to the governor's guards, he has just been turned over to the best trained, most ruthless Roman soldiers 
in the whole place, in the whole city, in the whole land, these were the toughest hardened ones. These were ones that would have no problem watching the punishment of another person. They wouldn't think twice about the guilt or innocence of another person. They would do their job, and it didn't matter how brutal. So, the text tells us that they scourged him. Well, that was the very typical method that the Romans used to sort of get someone ready to be crucified. They'd be tied to a post, bent over, probably naked, and then beaten with whips that were tied with pieces of lead and jagged bones and glass and things like that. It would tear the skin off your body. Almost no one went through that and remained conscious. Most people actually died before even being taken to be crucified from this action. And so it's there, through this punishment, that all the sin of all the world leaves Jesus completely alone. Now, our theme through this Lenten season is the people that take prominent positions in Jesus' passion, in Jesus' ministry, in Jesus' life that are from other places. Today, our text introduces us to Simon of Cyrene. Simon is a Jewish man's name. Cyrene is a city in Libya, so he traveled to be in Jerusalem from Africa. And he was there, almost definitely, for the Passover. This is something people would save for. They would uh, save their money and look forward to the opportunity to maybe once in a lifetime actually experience the Passover in Jerusalem. This was a mountaintop experience for Simon. Except, he just happened to be on that street at that time that he was separated from whoever he was with, and he was grabbed and told that it was going to be his job to help Jesus, who was just scourged close to death, carry his cross. For Simon, this is a nightmare. On a vacation that he looked forward to, and a religious experience that was a crowning achievement he could be proud of in a place where he should have looked forward to God's presence and peace and tranquility. Now, he's synonymous with a death row criminal carrying a cross through a mob of angry people. Now he's all alone. It's interesting, Simon of Cyrene, we know one more thing about Simon of Cyrene. When he's mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, it tells us that he's the father of Rufus and Alexander. And Mark being the first Gospel likely written, he would have only done that to show an affinity, a connection with the original readers and hearers of the Gospel of Mark. So the original readers and hearers of Mark knew who Rufus and Alexander were, which means Rufus and Alexander were almost definitely majorly well-known pastors and leaders in the early church. That tells us something. See, no matter how alone Simon may have felt when he was in the midst of the mob and carrying the cross of Jesus, he must have seen something. I bet he saw a loneliness 
in those eyes of Jesus that no one has ever seen before or since. I bet he saw a care, a compassion in those eyes of Jesus that grabbed him and wouldn't let him go. He saw something that day that he took with him. He saw something that day that became part of who he was. He saw something that day that he took home and taught his sons about. And what he taught his sons is what we teach each other. And that's that because Christ took that position of loneliness for us, we are never truly alone. And so no matter how far we push each other away with our actions, with our words, with our frustrations, he's always there. Reminding us he's there and calling us back to himself. No matter how nervous or scared or out of our element we may feel when the numbers go 200, 100, 50, 10, quarantined in place, we're reminded by the father of Rufus and Alexander that even quarantined in place, we can't be separated from the love of God and the presence of Jesus Christ that never leaves our side. And so in the worst of situations, in the loneliest of points, we learn that loneliness is something that in Jesus Christ we'll never know because he did it for us. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which certainly surpasses understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ to life eternal. Amen. We sing the hymn.
peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. mercy. For the gift of divine peace and of pardon, with all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the Holy Christian Church, here and scattered throughout the world, and for the proclamation of the gospel and the calling of all to faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this nation, our cities and communities, and the common welfare of us all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For seasonable weather and for the fruitfulness of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who labor, for those whose work is difficult or dangerous, and for all who travel, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all those in need, for the hungry and homeless, for the widowed and orphaned, and for all those in prison, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick and the dying and all those who care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all those in any kind of need, having to do with our current crisis of health, including medical personnel, including all those suffering from the economic benefits, including all of those who have lost wages, jobs, truck drivers, ranchers, farmers, grocery store workers, essential personnel in any kind of way, that they would find hope and strength abundantly in the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Finally, for these and for all our needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, your mercies are new every morning, and though we deserve only punishment, you receive us as your children and provide for all our needs of body and soul. Grant that we may heartily acknowledge your merciful goodness, give thanks for all your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Bless, Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and take them to heart, that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Together we pray the evening prayer. I thank, I thank you, my Heavenly Father, Father through, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day, and I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. We sing the hymn.
almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you.